on the reasons why plan giving is important to incorporate in your fundraising. And so a little bit about myself, I am with a company called Pleiades Nonprofit Advisors, and we contract with other nonprofits that maybe don't have a full-time plan giving officer or need some help with their marketing. And um, we kind of do fractional plan giving services so that we can help uh gift officers spend more time out with their donors and less time behind the desk, which we'd love to do. So um, I am a former plan giving director with the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, was there for five years, um, but I've been in development for about over, let's just say over 20 years, <laughs> starting to not wanting to say how long I've been doing this. Um, and then before I started Pleiades, um, most recently, I was the executive director of a uh, the Orange County Catholic Foundation in Orange County, California. And um, so just delighted to be with all of you. And I'm delighted that you have now joined the um, the Earthquake Club. Um, because, you know, we, we don't want to keep that all to ourselves. So anyway, um, thank you for having me. And I just want to see from a show of hands, is anybody already doing some plan giving outreach um, already a little bit? Okay. Maybe not, not too much. Okay. So what we're going to, what we're going to discuss today is how you can kind of get in the game without, um, you know, spending a lot of time on it. Because I know um, if you guys are, uh, you know, kind of a one man development operation, is any is is everybody kind of just uh, on their own as far as development goes, or does anybody have the luxury of like a full development team? We anybody have, have a full team? Maybe not. Two people in our office. Okay. All right. So, and the majority of the time, I mean, I came from a, a a two or three person team and the majority of the time you're, you're really just trying to get those current gifts in the door because you need to make budget and, and that's, what's important. And so um, I'm going to share a few things today that might help you secure current gifts and then also um, gifts uh, for, te you know, testamentary gifts later on. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started here. So basically, let's just, you know, define what planned giving is, because there's really two tracks. And a lot of times when we're thinking about planned giving, we are only thinking of gifts of bequest, testamentary gifts after someone passes away. But in actuality, it is two different tracks. So we have gifts for today and gifts for tomorrow. So gifts for today are donor advised fund distributions, QCDs from IRAs, so qualified charitable distributions from their IRAs, and appreciated property. And those can be current gifts and they can also fund uh, testamentary gifts later, and we'll get into that in more detail. Also gifts for tomorrow, where the majority of plan giving gifts come from, which is that of bequests, cash bequests, beneficiary designation, life income get gifts. And then what's really important when we're looking at planned giving is that um, there are going to be usually significant tax benefits for your donors that come along with these types of gifts. I had a colleague describe plan giving this way. It's any gift that you make to an organization that is takes longer than two minutes to write out a check, right? And so it's really anything other than a gift of um, from your disposable income. If you start working on the planned giving program and you at least are are consistent with it, you could see, your annual revenue in in a few years time comprise up from between 40 and 60% of your annual revenue can be coming from these planned giving vehicles okay so what we love is that you know all of those current gifts or major gifts or those gifts of $10,000 cash or or what have you that you're getting from your major donors um can hopefully be replaced and um, this is just going to help fortify that annual giving fund, okay? 
just to buy a, um, you know, if anybody just wants to shout it out, has anyone received bequests before? Yes. Okay. All right. Can you hear me now? Can you hear we me? We can, Wade. We oh, can good, hear good, you. Thank good, you. Good, now, Wade, yeah. tell me about that gift, Wade. Uh, it was, I think, fifty thousand dollars in size. I'm pretty sure that I should know. I'm the director of development. It was a couple <laughs> of years ago. Sorry about that. Uh -huh. And it was from from an individual who was um. He's given to other environmental organizations in this area. He was on the board of the New Jersey Conservation Foundation, but um, came as a bit of a surprise, and uh, we were certainly very happy to to get it unrestricted. Wonderful. So you were not aware that that gift was coming when you received not, it. Not, not really. No, okay. Not really. Okay. I, it was. I think. I think it was a time that he was, you know, looking at his legacy because he was. He's since passed away. So, um, you know, I think he was uh, making his his final planning. So yeah. Funny. Well, and you know, those gifts are great. We love surprises. I mean, I've, I've been able to open some of those checks myself and it's a nice surprise. Um, what we want to do is hopefully get you more surprises and then maybe even more that you know are coming, which is really great. So we're going to start inviting your donors to not only make these gifts, but also let you know that these are uh, in the works, that they're planned, that you can actually get a gift intention form from them and really um, start to steward those folks. But what a nice surprise they are. And if you start implementing some of these things, they will start to come in. And um, those are, you know, $50,000 was probably, the, is that one of the biggest gifts you got that year from an individual? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. So... That's the other nice thing about uh, estate gifts or, or planned gifts is typically they are larger than, you know, what you would normally receive from an individual. So a lot of times they are five and six figure gifts. Okay. All right. So here's here's the difference um, between, you know, your your major gifts and, and a lot of you are probably, you know, stewarding folks that, you know, are capable of of having those major gifts. Um, but what we're trying to do is give uh, in, encourage folks to give from their wealth and not their discretionary funds. OK, so. When we talk about giving from wealth, a person's wealth in the United States, what percentage do you think of their wealth is liquid? You have any ideas when we're, when you're looking at it, someone's to overall, um, all of their assets, what percentage do you think is, is liquid cash? Any guesses? Um, well, it's only 3%. Wow. 3% of the average individual's wealth is in their checking account or savings account. The majority of it is going to be equity in their home or properties, their IRAs, their stock portfolios. All of the assets that they own are far greater than the cash that they have. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about inviting people to give from their assets from their wealth, then they start thinking, oh, well, I have a lot more wealth over here than I'm, you know, when I'm looking in my checking account. So if we're only going to folks asking them for, you know, gifts of cash, please send money in for a, you know, a sponsorship or a donation, you know, you might get that thousand dollars or two thousand dollars annually. Um, but if they are sitting on an IRA, that could be a great resource for them. And then they're, if they're thinking, I'm, if I'm giving from my IRA and I know I've got $500,000 in that, it's a lot easier for them to part with some money out of that account than it is from their regular bank account, right? So we have to kind of reframe our ideas of uh, where wealth is and how we can talk to our donors about giving from more than just their bank account and their discretionary income. So what's also important to know is that between five and $11 trillion in the next 20 years are going to be moved from the baby boomers to their heirs, right? And I'm sure you've kind of all heard about that before, the big wealth transfer that's going to start happening in 2028. And um, right now we have got baby boomers 
turning, we have 10,000 baby boomers turning 65 every single day. Whereas up until the early 90s, we only had about 2,800 people turning 65 every day. So, you know, because they're turning 65 at, at that greater rate, they're also going to be passing away in great numbers as well. And that's where that big wealth transfer is going to come from. Another thing that um, some development directors or even, you know, executive directors worry is that, you know, we've all seen that pyramid, that that gift pyramid that I've uh, that I see where, you, you know, you've got your galas and your events at the bottom. And it's like that donor pyramid where then you get them to do annual giving, then you move them into major gifts. And at the very pinnacle is the planned gifts. Right. And. In my experience um, in doing this pretty pretty much nonstop for nine years, that is not the case for planned gifts. Like you may need to do that for the major gifts, but planned giving can come from anybody that is super dedicated to your organization. So let me give you an example. Um, but again, I was working with the Catholic Church, so we would have, you know, the 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 donor, the um, the senior citizen um, in the front pew that has given uh, ten dollars every month or a hundred dollars every month for the past fifty years to her parish, right? And um, that's all she's ever given. But her house is paid for. Maybe her husband predeceased her. Maybe she has no children. Maybe she does have some children, but she's been invited to make a gift um, to her parish. More often than not, 98% of the folks that I worked with, at least there and in, in, in other nonprofits, they've never written a five-figure check or a six-figure check to that organization. But they give consistently and annually, and, and that is more important than any track record of major giving. So a lot of times we hear, oh, well, you know, the next, if they gave you 5,000 or 10,000, you got to keep getting them up. And then eventually you can go and ask them for a planned gift. And I challenge that to say that you really need to be stewarding those folks that have been giving consistently to your organization for the past 20 years. And maybe they're just sending you a hundred dollar check every year. Those are the folks that are, prime for you to talk to about leaving an estate gift um, simply because they're not going to give you those major gifts unless they're sitting on an extreme amount of wealth. But most people, they don't know if they're going to need their money for health care. You know, that's a big concern for a lot of older individuals. If I give all of my money away now, I might need it for nursing home care, home health care, whatever might come my way. And so I'm going to hang on to those assets, but I definitely would be interested in doing an estate gift after I pass away. Okay. What we also find is that if you do secure a planned gift, the other concern is, well, you know, if we ask, um, you know, Mr. Smith for that Planned gift and they and he puts us in his estate plan and he's giving us 20% of his estate, he's not going to give in the major in, in the annual giving campaign anymore because he's already done the big gift. And that was always a concern of mine, you know, it, it, before I really got into this. It's like, oh, well, you know, you ask him to get put in the will, and then that's everything else shuts off because they're like, well, I've I've done the ultimate thing and now I'm not going to give anymore. Well, statistics show um, from Dr. Russell James, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, but if you are not, I invite you to follow him on LinkedIn and he publishes all sorts of these studies and he's out of Texas Tech and he's like the, the leading expert in the United States for all things plan giving. Um, and what he's, he has found um, by going through all these tax records and whatnot is that annual giving by those individuals increased by $3,000 a year once they decided that they were going to do a planned gift and included them in their estate, your, in your estate plan. And there's different schools of thought as to why that might be, but I think that for the most part, people then really want to make sure that you succeed and that you're still in business, so to speak, when they pass away, right? And so they want to ensure that um, 
your organization is thriving and doing well. And so they actually, that actually goes up. So not to be a concern um, if you're thinking that maybe their giving would go down. Um, also, 2.7 2 times more than um, total lifetime giving in their um, estate plans. So if their total lifetime giving was 5,000, uh, you can expect to get over 10,000 um, in in an estate gift, in a bequest. And then finally, what we need to look at is it's the highest rate of return when we're looking at fundraising, because I can talk to someone about um leaving a gift in their estate plan, if I if I talk to that donor and, and go and see them a few times and then talk to them about leaving a bequest, that bequest is typically five or uh, five or six figures. And that work for me was just as time consuming as going and asking someone for a $5,000 gift, right? And and trying to talk them into, you know, giving gifts of cash. So you're always going to get a larger gift in a planned gift than you would in a cash gift, in my experience. I mean, I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's, um, uh, you know, exceptions to that rule, but that's been my experience. What you'll find also um, from Dr. Russell James is, for a five-year nonprofit average growth in total revenue, if you are only um, focusing on getting gifts of cash, gifts of sponsorships, those type of things, you will grow your revenue over five years by 11% if all of that you're doing is focusing on those cash gifts. Um, once you start adding non-cash gifts into your fundraising efforts, that goes up to 50% more over a five-year period. Um, any non-cash gift to, you know, include gifts of stock or um, IRA distributions, those kind of thing. And then 66% if you start doing securities, um, including real estates and business interests. So if you really amp it up and you start accepting homes or gifts of properties, um, that really will, will make a big difference. So you can see that this is how quickly your donation revenue can grow. And um, it, it's just a good way to invest your development time. Um, I know it seems really tough when you've got an executive director that's coming in and they're like, what have you done for me lately? Where's the money for this month or, or what have you? And this really is a long-term strategy. It's a long-term game where you are planting the seeds and you're not going to see any, any type of movement until you're two, you're three. And so that's what makes it so difficult is, you know, your board is asking, you know, what kind of money is coming in. But if you work at this now, it will definitely show up later on. Okay, so where do we start? You know, you're a one, one person operation. And how do you start to build in some of these conversations and uh, in your programming, in your marketing and all of those kind of things, where do you start? And so we need to take a look at these these three these uh, five things. First of all, are you ready? Um, you need policies for gift acceptance. You need marketing. Um, you need to open conversations with your donors, and then finally the celebration and stewardship. So are you ready? This is a big one, right? Because, um, you know, you, you know that you need to get into this, but you need to have a little bit of groundwork laid. So first of all, you need to make sure that your leadership is at least on board somewhat with understanding how working on this now is going to, uh, convert into dollars later on, right? Marketing the most common vehicles um, is going to be key and you just have to have an outlet for that, right? Um, I'm assuming you all have like a monthly newsletter or an e-newsletter that you send out to your donors touch points. Does everybody kind of have those in place? Okay, so um, it's easy to 
add this in to a lot of the marketing efforts that you're already doing. So you don't have to do anything uh, separate, you know, I mean, some organizations do have actual plan giving newsletters and those kind of things. But if you're not to that level, you just start incorporating that into all that you're doing right now. Um, and into your, into your stewardship efforts, when you're talking to folks, have you remembered us in your estate plans? One of the things I would do on the back of all my business cards is um, put, have you, can please consider leaving us in your will or trust. This is our, this is the way you um, title it in your trust with our tax ID number. And that was on the back of every single business card. And then it was also on my uh, signature on my emails. Consider leaving us a gift, click here to learn more, that kind of thing yeah, in your estate plans. If you want to do a little bit more target um, outreach and you want to do, um, an independent newsletter, an e-blast or something with marketing to the, for these particular types of gifts. Certainly you're going to look at retirees, but you're also going to look, and, and most of you probably don't have donor ages, right? I mean, I think universities and such are, are really the, the lucky ones in that respect because they kind of have those ages, but um, long-term donors are, are key. So I would say when I work with my clients, I say anybody that has a donor history back to, you know, 2005, 2006, right along there, if they've been giving for 15 years, odds are good that they're going to maybe be over 60. And so, you know, that's kind of how you can, can start targeting those. And then the affinity, right? Folks that have been volunteering with your organization for a long time, volunteers are absolutely some of the best folks um, to target for these because they, um, they really believe in the mission, but they are probably not writing those big checks. Okay. And so, um, you know, we have museums or, or, uh, at the hospitals where I, where I, um, I speak, there's a lot of volunteers there, um, and they are prime for having these conversations. Um, and then, yeah, just at, at the end of the day, you're just looking at beyond major gift donors. And of course, they're always in the running too. But as you probably know, if you've got a major donor that's giving $50,000 to you, Wade, just like you mentioned, when you got that estate gift from the gentleman, he also had other organizations he was giving to in, in regard to that. So, you know, uh, New Jersey may be similar to um, Denver, where where I'm from, and in your specific areas, it's like everybody knows who the big players are. Everybody has them on their mailing list, and we're all trying to talk to them and recruit them to to give to us, right? And so you need to look at your individual pool of donors um, that may be outside of that, because um, you might be more successful than trying to go after these high net worth individuals that is on everybody's list. Okay. So for future gifts, this is where you can simply put on all of your, if you include buck slips in your thank you letters or something like that, did you know you can give us, um, uh, a gift from your from your will or trust. You can give us a percentage of your estate, a fixed amount. We accept real estate. We accept, you know, all, all sorts of gifts. Please consider giving to us. And again, you know, how, how you maybe title that. So if you don't have a web page specific for just planned gifts, um, there's, a, there's a few out there. I might be able to come up with some resources for you where it's just kind of listing the, the general types of planned gifts and maybe directing folks to those. And then maybe on your website also, like this is how you would include us in your state plan. I've got a, I've got a slide here at the end that kind of shows that. But just putting that out there because a lot of people, even though they might be really... Um, have a huge affinity with your organization, they may not think of you as a nonprofit to put in their estate plans. And unless they actually think about that or invited to do that, most people won't. The other problem is um, when they are making their estate plans, most attorneys or financial advisors 
aren't having the conversations of, do you want to leave something to charity in your estate plans? So typically when you go in and you're talking to those estate attorneys, unless they've been kind of working with our group or Dr. Russell, Russell James, um, they're just mostly concerned about your heirs that are your family members or your friends or, or whatnot. And they don't really talk about um, doing a charitable component to your estate plans. Same with your financial advisors. When they're asking you who their beneficiaries are, they're not saying, do you want to leave something to charity? And so unless the conversations are starting with you, they may not happen on the other side. Okay. So it's always good to, to keep that in front of folks. And then, um, talking to them about doing the beneficiary designations, because again, when you're looking at bequests, I'm not sure how it works in New Jersey, but you do need typically um, an attorney uh, to do a will or a trust here. I mean, I think you can do them online with LegalZoom or what have you, but again, I don't even think LegalZoom says, hey, in your in your plans, is there um, do you want to leave something to charity? Right. And so when you're doing these bequests, they're going to need to go through an attorney. And a lot of times they, whoops, they, a lot of times they don't want to pay for that. So they're like, well, I've already got my estate plan in order and I really don't want to change anything. That's a great segue for you to say, but you could add us as a, as a beneficiary to your retirement plan or your life insurance plan um, stocks. This is a great way to invite your board members to become kind of a founding member of your legacy society, which by the way, if if you don't already have um, a society, you should talk to your um, your your board executive um, committee and just say, you know, we'd like to launch this. It's it's helpful to have the board chair or someone else on the board invite the rest of the board members to become members and to do that. And so that's a great way to get them in. Because you can say, all you have to do is um, change your beneficiary on life insurance or something, and you don't have to go through an attorney to do any of that. So it's a really easy way. And to make it even more simple, you um, I've seen some organizations that just say, join our 3% club, make us a 3% beneficiary of your, of your retirement account or something along those lines. And um when people look at it like that, that it's not very much and it's not going to take away from their heirs. It's not going to make a change in, you know, their, their heirs lifestyle. If they don't get that extra 3%, it's a great way to, to start that conversation. Okay. If we're looking at increasing future gifts, um, this is when, um, your loyal donors are going to leave bequests and within five to 12 years, these matured gifts are going to make a significant total of your annual fund if you start doing this now, right? So a good portion of that bequest maturities. So wait, if you had three of those bequests that came in annually at that $50,000 level, would that make a significant difference in your organization annually? without question. Okay. And $50,000 in some of these folks' estates, um, I don't know what the property values are going, what, what's happening out in, in your areas, but I can tell you that here, our property values are going up 10% a year sometimes. And if people bought their house 20 or 30 years ago, they might have a significant amount of wealth in their homes, right? And so if they leave even just a small percentage of that to your organization, $50,000 can add up in a hurry. If they leave their entire home to you, I don't know what the average home out there is, three or $400,000, maybe higher. But if you got one home a year, that could make a tremendous difference as well. So you have to be thinking, um, I can do all this work to try and get the, these uh, annual fund dollars in the door, or I can get one home a year in somebody's estate plan and what a difference that would make, right? And if you get two, you know, just think how that snowballs. Um, retirement plan gifts, same thing. If somebody is leaving you a percentage in the, of their IRA, that's wonderful. And then plan gift maturity. So that's going to be, you know, your charitable gift annuities, 
your charitable trust that maybe somebody has has funded and that's going to be maturing later on. So all of these pieces can equal a big amount in your overall annual fund if you start laying the groundwork. Kimberly? Yes. We had uh, an example of exactly what you just described. We had an elderly couple who have supported us for years on a $1,000 level, $1,500 level, tell us they're going to give us their home when they're no longer going to live there. They're going to just gift it to the Great Swamp Watershed Association. Well, they have a daughter who lives in Canada who they're almost sure has no interest in having the home. And to you know, further elaborate on your example, um, our executive director and an attorney who came in and spoke with them about how they could do that, they're a bit skeptical because they're thinking by the time they reach the age where the home, and they're elderly now, but by the time they reach the age where they vacate the home, one or either of them might be in assisted living at that point, and the monies to sell the home would be needed to pay for assisted living. So we have to see how this is going to go. But it's I'm sorry to interrupt you, but when you brought up that example, I was thinking we've been down that road, and we're sitting yeah. here wondering, you know, if we're going to get a, it's probably a $450,000 home, something like that, in the town. That's Wonderful. So you could look at doing a retained life estate or the other option is if they want to gift the home, um, just you could go ahead and write a charitable gift annuity mm -hmm. for them. Okay. Um, and that would be another great way to do that. Right. And I have some resources for you. If you go to the National Charitable Gift Annuity Foundation, they can actually do that gift for you make you the beneficiary. You are not on chain of title. Um, it's a great way to, to set something like that up. They could actually do that now and stay in the home. Um, mm -hmm. So we call that a retained life estate. They can, they can gift the home now, stay in the home. They'd still, and then they can start receiving money um, out of that annuity, or they can put it in a charitable trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you want to contact me offline, I can I can help you with that a little bit more. But um, definitely some ways to do that um, because, yeah, if they do need to go in assisted living, if it's a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar home and it's paid for, and they do a CGA, how old are they? I would say mid seventies. Okay. Maybe pushing eighty. So it. 80 their rate of return if they're if they're both 80 could be 6.8 percent that they would be getting on that so funding um a cga with the home um so i don't know what i don't know how much that would end up being Thirty thousand a year or something like that. That that's mm -hmm. the issue is that you know a CGA is not going to pay them what it's going to cost them to be in an assisted living. They could also do a bargain sale. Um, so that's something else that you might want to take a look at as well, where they would get a lump sum of cash in, um, and your organization could um, take the rest. Mm -hmm. And they could get a nice tax deduction. And I don't know if they're, you know, needing the tax deduction at this point, but lots of different vehicle options available for you. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I think a bargain sale might actually work the best because then they could get that lump sum and just go on. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, we can we can talk more about that offline. But yeah, just if you think about somebody giving a gift of a home or um, a gift of property that they no longer need, vacant property or what have you, um, anything that has to do with that right now is going to get you at least a six figure gift. And um mm -hmm. And it's going to benefit the donors. And, and so that's something else that I kind of want to talk about is because these gifts not only help your organization, but it's also solving the problem of a donor. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we, that, we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, so current gifts. I encourage you to use... Um, Use your outreach to um, notify your donors about these different types of ways that they can give. First one is the IRA distributions. 
And so if you have any donors that are over 70 and a half and they have an IRA, they can give up to $100,000 a year out of their IRA directly to you and it will bypass um, income tax for them. Okay, so they, and by the time they're 73, they have to take out what's called a required minimum distribution, which means they have to take out a minimum, I think it's 3.7% once they turn 73 annually of whatever is in that account. If they're still working or they don't need that distribution, it doesn't really matter because they have to take it because the government wants to tax it. So if they don't need that money, what they can do is say, instead of writing you a $5,000 check for um, my sponsorship this year or, or what have you, they ask their custodian of their IRA to send the money directly to your organization and it will bypass them having to take that as income and getting taxed on that. And that also helps them because if they are in a higher tax bracket and then now they've got to take out 50,000 or whatever it is, it could bump them up into a higher tax bracket for that. And it also affects how much they have to pay for Medicare because Medicare is charged on a sliding scale and the more income it looks like you have, the higher the amount they're going to have to pay for that. So I've got some donors that love doing this because it lowers their AGI. Um, and so that's that's a great way for folks to give, especially if they're already writing you a check, you know, just have it come directly from their from their IRA. Yeah. The, the other thing um, that you can encourage people to do is with donor advised funds. I don't know if you're at partnering with any local um, foundations over there that run um, donor advised funds, you know, community foundations, but um, it's always good to remind people that they can make a gift to you from their donor advised fund. And then stocks and bonds and mutual funds. If you are not already set up to take those, I encourage you to get, get set to be able to take those. Um, it takes a little bit of legwork on your on your end if you're not already. Is there anybody that's already accepting gifts of stock? Yes, we are. Okay. You need to use um, either your bank or um, another organization. Sometimes the um, community foundations can accept the gifts of stock on your behalf and, and liquidate. Mm -hmm. Um, if you do accept gifts of stock, you'll want to put together a, a stock form that your donors can complete and uh, give to their custodian that they want so much stock transferred to you and you need different um, DTC numbers and those kind of things. Get that set up, put it on your website or have it available that if somebody says, I do want to do a gift of stock, that you have that stock information ready to go. Um, because you won't be able to accept it without that. Okay. And then certainly uh, encourage the donors to inform you that they have made that gift and that it's coming. Um, what is my understanding is if somebody transfers stock to your bank and um, you don't know who it is, it's not going to show who, who made the gift. It's just going to say you've got a transfer of 12 shares of AT&T stock and from you know, Schwab, and that's all you're going to get. So you're not going to know who it belongs to. So definitely have those things in place so that people can let you know um, who it's from. And then of course, if they do transfer the stock, this is something that you can put in your, in, in your marketing materials is that they will bypass capital gains um, and they will get a tax deduction on, on making those gifts of stock. So that's always a great way to go. Okay. And then real estate, this is where you're going to have to, you know, get a little bit more invested and Wade sounds like you're starting to kind of um, take a look at being able to accept gifts of real estate. What you'll want to do, certainly before you start accepting real estate, art, collectibles, all those kind of things, is have some gift acceptance policies in place. Um, because Gifts of appreciated assets are not going to always be so easy, cut and dry. And there may be some things that people want to give to you that you do not want to take. 
Timeshares comes to me as a perfect example. We at the diocese did not want to take timeshares because it actually ends up costing us money. <laughs> and, you know, you have to pay on that forever. And, and so we, people will always try and donate that because it just, you know, they were trying to get out from under it themselves or, or pieces of property in areas that are not going to be, um, beneficial for your organization. Right. And so, um, again, in, in LA, there's a big desert North of LA, um, Palmdale area. And there, uh, there's people that own a lot of pieces of, um, random property up there. They've been trying to sell it for years. They can't give it away. So then they want to come to us and ask us to take it. And it's like, well, I don't want it either because I can't sell it. Right. So do your due diligence. And just because somebody comes in and says, I've got this great piece of property and I want to donate it to you, make sure it's something that you really want to take. And it's not going to end up being a, a burden on you. And then you're paying taxes on something that you can't get rid of. Right. Um, and so I encourage everybody to have a really good um, relationship with some real realtors that if somebody says, hey, I've got a property that I want to give you, you can send it over to your realtor and say, can you take a look at this property? Is it worth, you know, um, me taking what are there any encumbrances on it? Those type of things. Um, and I would leave your gift acceptance policy kind of um, flexible in saying that it, the you will accept gifts of property um, as approved by you know the board committee or what have you. So that way it gives you an out. Um, it gets more difficult so to say you know you've got this really great donor and they come to you and they want to give you this gift of property and you know that that's not going to be. Um, something that you want because it's going to be more of a burden for your organization you need to have an out to say you know what the committee said we we can't really take this and make it all about the committee and not you or your executive director um because you may need those instances um arts and collectibles same thing i i don't know if you've ever gotten calls people i decorative plates have been uh, <laughs> a big thing that people always want to donate. My, my grandmother has a, a 500 decorative plates um, that they bought in the 70s or 80s when that was really big and we want to donate them to you. And well, it, no, thank you. That's okay. So just to have those available um, so that you can turn down gifts if necessary, because um, what some folks don't realize is you don't have to take everything that people want to give you, right? Okay, any questions about the um, gift policies or um, accepting gifts of real estate, stocks, those types of things? Well, uh, Kimberly, were you saying that the gift acceptance policy should apply only to real estate or to any type of? It, they should apply um, to pretty much everything, right? Yeah, so yeah. in your gift acceptance policy, and you can, you know, what I would recommend is maybe going to a local university or maybe one of the hospital foundations. And, and you know, if, if you're, you know, colleagues out there would, would want to share what they have in place, you know, that's always a good place to start. I say just why reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of great gift policy manuals out there. Um, I would have a, in your policy stating that if you do get a gift of stock that you're, um, your policy is that you liquidate it immediately and use the cash. Yeah. You don't sit on it, those type right. of things, because, you know, you're going to have people, well, you know, maybe we should just keep the stock because we think it's going to go up in value or those type of things. So just spell out what you're going to do with every single type of gift so that there's just no um, leeway. I think that's really important. Um, also with real estate, unless it is a piece of land that is, you know, next that that you can actually use as an organization that your policy is that you will sell it because um, some people want you to. Well, you know, this was our, our farm and we want to give it to you and we want you to run the farm now. Right. And so you just have to say, look, we our policy is we liquidate any type of real estate unless we can immediately benefit from it. Um, so those kind of things. So um, and. I just think it's very important for you to have all of those things lined up so that when somebody comes to you, you have an, an, a reason 
um, either to take it or not to take it. Um, the other thing that you might want to consider as well in your gift policies is I, I have a couple of clients that say any planned gift that we receive, like that 50,000 that you got weighed goes directly into our endowment. It's mm -hmm. earmarked for endowment. So some organizations, because it's kind of like found money, say that they want it to go into a specific program or something like that. So that's another thing that your gift policies could say, unless it's a restricted gift. That's something else that you'll want to talk to um, your donors about when I mentioned restricted gifts is um, try to make sure, you know, if I'm, if they're going to put you in their will, that it really kind of just is for general operations, because sometimes they can put restrictions on that gift that you might not be able to use. Right. It's like, I, I'm going to give you $50,000. And with this money, I want you to go and buy um, a thousand acre nature preserve. Well, it's $50,000 is not going to cover that. And so if I take this money, now I've got to fundraise for the rest of that. Um, and so do I now have this huge burden of trying to fundraise and, and be able to use that 50,000 or do I just not accept it? So see if you can, when you're, when you're putting this out and, and people are putting it in writing, leave it for general operations is the best thing or unrestricted. Okay. Unless there's a specific thing you want, but I, I just think if somebody passes away 15 years from now and it's for a program that you have in place now, but that program no longer exists, then you run into some issues about, well, can we even accept the gift because that program no longer exists? And so you kind mm -hmm. of tie yourself up a little bit. So that's what I would recommend is just making sure that um, you can talk to your donors and say, really the best thing to do. And you can say, we'd prefer that it go to this, but if that program is no longer in existence, then it can go to general ops or something like that. I would definitely recommend that. Okay. So we talked about in increasing your current gifts and then gift acceptance policies. We got into that. Valuations of the gift. So um, if somebody has a... Rolex that they say is worth $50,000 and they want to give it to you, or they have a piece of art. Um, the valuation of the gift is not um, for you to determine. And I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's going to have to be um, appraised by them. I mean, I suppose you can pay, pay for the appraisal, but you do not assign that valuation to the gift. That's for, for your donor to do. Um, and then how do you uh, count that? I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but um, make sure it is easy to liquidate. Um, some, some organizations have taken jewelry or whatnot, and then if they have an annual gala, they can turn around and auction it off. So there are ways, you know, that you can accept some of those more unique type of gifts and, and be able to liquidate that later. But still, you know, always be aware that just don't ever accept something that you're not sure that you can liquidate, I guess is the bottom line. Um, real estate, same thing. Somebody wants to give you um, a gasoline station. <laughs> you guys, are, you guys are environmentalists. <laughs> Who's going to want to accept that? And I've had people uh, come up and say, "Oh, you know, it was a gas station about fifty years ago. It hasn't been used for that in a long time, so I'm sure it's fine." Oh Lord, no! Thank you. We'll uh, we'll we'll pass on that. So. Um, and, and I know that you guys are definitely, um, organizations that will be taking those types of things into, into deep consideration, um, getting real estate, maybe you're getting an apartment complex that has tenants. Also something to think about. Do we want to accept that? Do we want to be on chain of title? I know at least in our organization and, and yours too, your, your, um, your name, your reputation are very important to you in the community. And 
say you get a rental home and um, you've you've accepted that and you've got somebody that's a tenant and they stop paying you. What are you going to do with that tenant? <laughs> because uh, I can tell you the tenant, the first thing the tenant's going to do is go to the newspaper and say, did you know this environmental group that, you know, is, is so wonderful is now trying to kick me out of my house. Um, so it's very tricky with some of these um some of these matters and sometimes you just have to make sure that the tenant's already out or those type of things before you become a landlord and i have two organizations right now that i'm working with one of them is a hospital organization they accepted a home with a tenant the tenant said i'm going to buy this home in um two years they funded a charitable gift annuity with it that is um that tenant is still there 10 years later and she's only paid rent about half the time that she's been there. And my client is like, we, we don't know what to do. We don't want to throw her out because of the optics. So something to consider. And then uh, again, those timeshares that just kind of are, are kind of a, a noose around your neck in a lot of ways because of all the, the fees involved. Um, gift agreement forms, make sure that you have a current good gift agreement form. And um, for most of these gifts, they are going to be revocable. So it's always good to share with your donors that if they change their mind, they can always decide that they want to revoke their gift. And But we know from um, Dr. Russell James that that very, very rarely happens. So once you're in, the idea is you want to continue stewarding that relationship and make sure that you're still inviting those folks to everything. You're still going out and, and doing donor visits and all of those things um, because that gift could go away, um, but most likely it won't. So you just want to make sure. Um, and then also for counting and tracking, I don't know what your policies are internally. I know that that's always been a concern between development officers and financial, the financial office as to what we're going to count because this person is only 65. We might not see this for 30 or 40 years, so we're not going to count this as a gift. And so... Um, what I always did is I had an above the line and a below the line and below the line, I knew all the stuff that was kind of in my pipeline that, that, um, that I could count, but I also knew that that not, would not necessarily make it to our, to our finance department budget sheet, right. As to what they're counting on. And, and if it, if it did, they would definitely discount that and, and all those kind of things. And I don't know how advanced, um, most of your organizations are in that, but I would just always just uh, put it into, you know, my CRM to say, you know, this is when I expect this gift to mature. Um, and this is how much I expect it to be. And you just kind of let it go from there. I don't know. Do, yeah. I, do any of you have a, a special way that you are counting those gifts or do you have some, some hard and fast guidelines in your um, organizations on how, what gifts count? We are at time. My question oh. to the group is, is it okay if you continue on into the group? Is that, is it okay to stay on? I can stay on. It's up to you all. I, I'm getting pretty close. So I will, I will move on and wrap it up. Can, um, can so I, from know, Mark, I'm sorry. Quick, real quick. Yeah. Just a quick question. The gift agreement form is not legally enforceable though, correct? No. No, it's just a, pledge it's like a pledge pledge agreement that's it yeah okay Thanks. the pledge agreement i mean if they're doing you know a, a charitable trust or something like that then yes there are times when it can be legally enforceable um if you get you know uh, an attorney to draw it up to say that this is going to count against their oh, wow. um their estate and it's and it's an irrevocable gift you can do that um and i've had i've had uh donations like that i would say most of the time when you're doing that kind of thing is because you're doing some type of naming opportunity and you want to make sure that you get paid. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's usually like for a $5 million gift where you're, you know, building something and, and you want to make sure that you're getting that money. And so at that point, that would be tied to an irrevocable gift and that would be enforceable. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so again, just marketing all of these things um, where you're, 
you're showing um, marketing the IRA distributions um, can be a great way to just kind of get your foot in the door with with some of these donors um, marketing the gifts of appreciated stock and and letting them know that you're available for those. And then encouraging folks to um, add beneficiaries on their life insurance. And I think if you just add like a little box or snippet each month with these different types of giving vehicles and just kind of plant that seed every single month. And then maybe also if you have a, um, a legacy society, you can invite people to join the Legacy Society. By the way, you, did you know you can join our Legacy Society by making a gift of, of stock or including us in your estate plans, those type of things. So just being intentional and, and planting that all the time, the more they see it, the more um, they're they're going to need to see it more than once, I guess is, is my thing. You know, the, you might throw that out there, but you, you really have to be um, consistent about your messaging about that. Mm -hmm. And then here's, here's, um, some sample bequest language, um, that you can use, including your, uh, tax ID, what the purpose is, how much those type of things. So you can always give them uh, sample language that way on your, uh, website. Okay. And then again, really consistency is key. I would do messaging at least quarterly, invite and acknowledge. If you have some folks that have already given in their in the Legacy Society or people that um, you want to, what I recommend is, is inviting the folks that have already included you in their estate plans and inviting your board members and then anybody that you would like to consider being in your legacy society and have a little reception for them every year. And it doesn't have to be big. Um, a lot of times it's only 20 or 30 people. It can be very small, but just, you know, acknowledging the folks that have done something, Wade, in your case, if there's family members of that individual that left you something, invite them, come and give them, you know, a, a, a pin or a certificate for, for doing that. And um, I would definitely start a little, legacy program where annually you're you're inviting folks to join and thanking them for for doing that but i wouldn't just limit it to the people that are in the society i would invite the folks that you want to be in that society mm -hmm. okay and how do you get those folks oops i don't know if anybody is doing a oh, let me go back for just one second one of the ways that you can find out who might be interested in doing um, an, a gift in their estate plan is if you do a survey. So if none of you have done a survey in a while to your donors, you could do a free one on SurveyMonkey, keep it to nine questions. And um, I do this through Crescendo a lot with my clients. I don't know if any of you have that um, that software, but basically it you know asks really just basic questions in the beginning. And then you kind of get down to the nitty gritty of um, really what you're trying to find out. So one of them would be, how do you prefer us to connect with you? Email, letter, you know, um, social media, those kind of things. Um, why do you continue to support us? Uh, those, those type of things and just leave it like that, you know, and then you can say, would you be interested in learning more about gifts that um, you exchange a, a donation for income for life. Have you considered, uh, have you, or would you consider leaving us in your estate plans? Those type of things. And then you get a nice little lead list off of that survey. So I would highly recommend you do one of those. We get the best information off of our surveys every year of people that have already left us in their will that we didn't know or that would consider doing a gift. And then there you have your, you know, your hot leads right there um, because you've asked. So great way to do that. All right, so I think we are at time. I'm gonna give you my, um, so I'm Pleiades Nonprofit Advisors. You can reach me that way. Um, we do a blog if you wanna sign up for our um, e-newsletter. We send, we include a lot of, um, blogs from Dr. Russell James and some other industry leaders to try and, you know, help you make your program better. And we're always um, trying to up our game in that area as well. 
So I would love to connect with you that way. And then I also have some resources for anybody that does want to be able to accept these um, gifts of appreciated assets, but may not have the infrastructure to be able to do so internally. We have some, we have some, um, some relationships with these uh, organizations that can do that for you. So thank you very much. I, um, Lauren, thank you again for inviting me back. Love to be a resource for you all. So if you do have any questions, I'm always happy to, to get in touch and, and answer what I can. And Kimberly, you're reachable uh, through the website of Pleiades. How do you pronounce it? Pleiades. Pleiades, Pleiades, Pleiades Nonprofit Advisors. Yeah. Okay. So my email is Kimberly. I should have put that on here. Kimberly at Pleiades NPA for nonprofitadvisors.com. All written out, Pleiades Nonprofit yeah. Advisors. No, just Pleiades and then NPA. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So Pleiades is actually a constellation. Um, it's, it's also known as the Seven Sisters. Huh. Um, but it's Pleiades in Greek, but everybody knows what Pleiades is in Japanese. Subaru. <laughs> so next time you see Subaru logo, you're gonna see those stars, and now you're gonna remember. <laughs> Okay, great. Kimberly, Pleiades, NPA dot com. Dot com, right. Yeah, right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate you coming, Kimberly, especially for a second time joining us from the West Coast as you have the remainder of the day and we're just starting to end our day. So thank you. For Absolutely. My pleasure. And Good job. I congratulate you all on the work that you're doing out there is very noble. Uh, we need more organizations like yours that are that are protecting our resources um, for future generations. So I applaud you for all the work that you're doing. Mm, thank you. Our next gathering is going to be on May 29th at Grounds for Sculpture. And that includes a tour as well as networking with one another. And I'll send out the list um, of additional sessions as well. You're also going to see a survey coming up on picking a date to meet at Monmouth Conservation Foundation. It's going to be a fun location. Um, we have two dates and we need to settle on a date. So we're, we're looking to everybody to settle that date for us. So be on the lookout for that. As well as Kimberly's slides. She's provided us the deck. I'll also share um, AFP's sample of their gift policy I'm sorry, their gift, gift acceptance policy as well with that and some of the resources uh, Kimberly has mentioned as, uh, along with her contact information and uh, website for additional resources. Great. Great, 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 great. Thank you, Lauren. Everybody enjoy it. Thank you for staying. All right. Thanks all. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.